so I was just talking with Miranda Oakley, and the cool thing about this, this festival, essentially, is the way I see it, this, this facelift, is that it's about local voices, so much of it. And not only is Miranda so local that she's like here right now about to come on stage, but she actually lives at Takoya. Anybody know what Takoya Dorm is? Yeah. See, like, she, she lives here, like, she's home. And keep this into perspective, they say there's 5 million people that come to the park each year. That's about 14,000 people a day coming and like to your house and like hanging out. And so the resource does get used. And that's wonderful because it's such a beautiful resource. But we try and tread lightly. And the beauty of the facelift is that we leave it better than when we found it. So Miranda's a local. She works for the Yosemite Mountaineering School. And she's been working them for about five years. And I'm like, so what one thing would you change about your job at the YMS? She's like, maybe I'd have more time off to be more gnarly and climb more walls. Because when I was talking with her about Alex Honnold and free soloing, free rider, she's like, I was like, well, what, how does that make you feel? She's like, maybe I should go back and free free rider again in a day. Gnarly. Come on, make some noise. And then Ken's like, oh, and by the way, she's like, just kind of does, you know, a first female solo, rope solo of the nose in a day. First one ever. That's right. That's right. like so gnarly, like so committed, but yet her favorite climb, and one of my favorite climbs, and I'm sure many of you in the audience share this climb, Cathedral Peak. Because it's not about the gnar, it's not about the first ever. In fact, everybody climbs that because that's something we can all relate to. That's something we can all agree upon. The absolute beauty and audacity of Yosemite National Park as embodied by being on the summit of Cathedral Peak. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miranda big it is. So I had that view for the first time in my life, 
And I was just like petrified. I was so scared. After a month of like traveling across country and climbing all these new areas, um, I was scared to even admit that I was a climber. I was like, oh, maybe I'm just here to go hiking and smell wildflowers. <laughs> But yeah, luckily, I managed to land a job at Tuolumne um, Lodge as a camp helper. And yeah, Tuolumne was awesome. <laughs> Looking back, it was one of the best jobs I've ever had. Like, I was just like washing dishes, making beds, maybe busting tables sometimes if I was lucky. And on the weekends, I would bag peaks and go bouldering, and I found even a few sport climbs that were like well protected. Um, so yeah, that's orange cloud right there. <laughs> Pretty classic little sport climb in the meadows. Um, so yeah, but eventually I kind of was like, okay, what's this whole like valley climbing thing about? I kind of got more intrigued to kind of try some bigger stuff, try track climbing, learn how to climb some cracks. Um, so yeah, I managed to land a job in Yosemite Valley at the mountain shop, like super part time, which is great. And my friend Ruth Spivey, who I knew from the lodge, she was the cook there, um, she was like, yeah, come be my roommate. And we can go climbing together. And it was great. So not only did she let me go climbing with her, but she was a great mentor and just taught me the ways of like the old school valley climbing. As you can see, she's got a piercing. <laughs> um, so but she also was like, yeah, you can borrow my back whenever you want. And I was like, really? I can borrow your back? Because like, you know, most people are you know, like, like, what movie borrow their back? On the condition that I would replace any gear that I lost or got stuck. Um, so yeah, she let me borrow her rack, and I just started kind of figuring it out. Um, managed to make my way up some climbs, but a lot of the times I was like epicking really hard. <laughs> I bailed off of a bunch of climbs, or like got benighted on all these climbs, had to leave gear, you know, I got shut down by 5'7", five 5'8". Seven, five Has anybody ever been shut down by a 5'7"? <laughs> okay, well, that's really um, So yeah, but you know, eventually started figuring things out, got to the top of some things. Ruth and I did Serenity and Sons. When we topped out as the sun was setting and like got our rope stuck on the way down. <laughs> Almost had to call his boyfriend at the time and get him to rescue us. But luckily we got our ropes up stuck. Uh, yeah, even climbed some stuff in high Sierras. I'm so glad I got Lasix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eventually I was even able to do some of the test pieces around the valley, like the Rastrum and Astrum Man. Yeah. And you know, I started kind of dipping my toes into like the big wall climbing. That's liberty. That's the people from Liberty Cap right there. Um, yeah. So as I got into this big wall climbing, I was always kind of limited by my two-day weekends, you know. So I ended up having to do a lot of this stuff, this stuff in pushes. For example, half dough, I did the push my first time, but it's not like I did it that quickly. It kind of took like 18 hours, and I ended up sleeping on top. I don't know if you guys can see in the photo, but I'm totally age climbing pink on ledge, just like five feet. <laughs> but that's the way it went for a little while. Um, that was training, training for bigger days. Uh, and eventually I started hanging out with this guy. This is Josh McClure. <laughs> so Josh is a valley local. He's probably one of the most underestimated, badass valley climbers here today. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but like at first we kind of like were eyeing each other up, we're like climbing partners, and then we became, became this romantic thing. And eventually we were just like hanging out all the time and climbing together almost exclusively. Uh, oh, and then there's Alex Evans. So this is our first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is my first time. Of El Cap. I think Josh and Alex had done it a bunch before, but you know, again, we're limited by our work schedule, so we decided to go for it in a push. And so we chose a smaller route, Lurking Fear, which is one of the shorter routes in El Cap, kind of to the left. You guys are familiar. Um, and it took us 26 hours, which, I mean, is kind of a long time for a push, a little over 24. Um, but yeah, I kind of started kind of liking it. I was like, oh, I kind of like climbing through the day and climbing through the night. 
and into the next morning. <laughs> and I don't even need my headlamp for the hike down. <laughs> so, I don't know why I liked it. I guess I just like like the sense of satisfaction, like just like being super tired, things like that. Um, so yeah, continued to progress, looking for these longer days, and my objectives kind of grew as I grew as a climber. Eventually, um, you know, I decided I was ready for the nose in a day, and Josh had done the nose in a day a bunch at that point. But for me, this is my first time, and I felt like I was finally like a good enough partner where I could do it. And Josh felt the same way. He's like, okay. We're not gonna get too. We're not gonna have too hard. And then we didn't. It was great. We, it was fun. It was a fun day. I don't remember how long it took us, but it was somewhat casual. Maybe a little bit more casual than those guys at that time. But, <laughs> um, so yeah, things started getting a little quicker. It started getting more. Um, yeah, and then, oh, in 2013, I became a climbing guide for Yosemite Mountaineering School. But there's a big step up for me from, like, waiting tables. Although I love waiting tables at the Tuolumne Meadows Lodge, but, um, you know, climbing guiding, at least I was kind of... I just loved that being able to kind of help people become... go from, like, where I was not that long ago to becoming competent, like, self-sufficient climbers and kind of setting them up in the right path. Um, so, yeah. Cool. And oh yeah, and so then I started doing um, the whole like climber dirtbag circuit. I'm sure some of you in the audience know what that circuit is. It's like you know Yosemite Valley in the spring, High Sierra Tuolumne Meadows in the summer, um, the creek in the fall, and then South America in the wintertime. And one of the places I fell in love with in South America was this place called Cochamo, Valle Cochamo, and. Um, it's in the northern reaches of Patagonia, on the Chilean side. And people call it the like, Yosemite of South America, whatever that is. Uh, because it's got these like giant granite walls with pretty similar quality of granite, like really good granite. Um, but yeah, Cochamo is a little bit different. Like for example, there's no road going into Cochamo, so it's pretty remote. Um, the granite has these, uh, so there's uh, Kojimo is in the Valdivian rainforest, so it rains for like days on end. So some of the granites formed a little bit differently. For example, like it doesn't have the same cracks that we have in Yosemite. Um, in Kojimo, they're kind of like grooves, kind of like butt cracks. Finally, <laughs> 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 they're like this. It's hard to get your in. Um, but despite all that, I fell in love with Kojimo and I went back like year after year after year. Um, I just love the way the like clouds would come in and just engulf you. I even got a photo of the first ascent there with my friends Chris Kalman, Megan Kelly, and Tasha Jankowski, which is the girl there drilling a bolt. We were drilling some repel bolts for the way down. So I was super lucky to be able to put up a first ascent called we called it Siete Venas, um, and it's just this like incredible crack system that went up through like super varied terrain. <coughs> Yeah, and then eventually Josh convinced me to go into Patagonia. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna, or, sorry, El Shell 10, which is, in the southern, which is in southern Patagonia. It's a little bit more real there, I guess you could say. Um, so the weather in Patagonia is some of the worst in the world. Um, and having a weather window like this was extremely rare. So my first time in Patagonia, um, we actually had a huge weather window, like five days long, which is pretty incredible for Patagonia. Uh, it was so good that we had like these blue skies. Josh was even able to light a cigarette on the summit, which was like unheard of. But yeah, I went down there, even was able to put up a first ascent with these guys, Josh McClure and John Rambo, on a little peak down there called De La S. And I say little, but it's like, I don't know, a thousand feet or so. Um, and it's in the Fitzroy NASA, so kind of one of the little peaks on the Patagonia skyline on the logo. So that was pretty cool. And those are the good times in Patagonia, right? And there are some not so good times. But those times were almost just as important, right? Because I learned so much from this moment right here. I learned that I'm not an alchemist. You know? <laughs> and I don't like climbing in the cold. If not for that moment, I could still be trying to like ice climb. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, I 
come back, do these chose sounds sound, come back to Yosemite and try to like hone my skills a bit more, kind of try to push myself a little bit harder. Do you guys know what that climb is? Yeah, it does power. It's got a little off width at the top to kind of challenge you. Um, another nice little photo, fish crack. Uh, yeah, Josh and I kept whittling our time down on the nose. Eventually, it got to be where like the nose wasn't that sad. I didn't get that satisfying feeling from like climbing El Cap anymore, where it's so like it took you know 27 hours or whatever. It was just like super exhausted afterwards. I'd get to the top and be like, okay, that's cool. Let's go like drink some beers. I'm like, what do you want to climb tomorrow? You know. So it wasn't quite satisfying anymore. I kept I was kind of looking for something like, what's next? You know. Um, and we also did climb half dome a bunch too. That's not half dome, that's the nose. Um, but eventually I came up with the idea like I wanted to do both in a day, half dome and nose. Um, and Josh had done it a bunch before, so it was obviously a good partner for that. Um, but I had never done it, so I really wanted to do it. And so yeah, it went down pretty easy. I think it took like 22 hours or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that was great, but at the same time, our relationship was like deteriorating. We were starting to grow our separate ways, and eventually we split up. And all of a sudden, I found myself without a climbing partner and without a boyfriend. And I was at this point in my life where I'd just done something like super awesome, or what I felt like was pretty awesome. And I wanted to do something even more awesome, you know, like push myself even further. But I didn't really have a partner for that. And, you know, I'd go over to the star site, and I had a lot of friends on star who were like super capable of some like things like that, but we had never climbed stuff like that before. So you can't exactly like go up to some person you've never climbed with, even if you've known them for years, and say, "Hey, let's do two El Cap routes today." I'm just gonna be like, "What?" Are we doing? <laughs> so I was kind of struggling, but at some point in the game, Eric Sloan put the idea in my head that I should try to solo the nose, and I was like. Eric's crazy. He's totally lost it. Like, why would he? Like, I can't do that. Um, but like that idea, he like plugged the idea in my head. And eventually, I started thinking about it, like a little more, a little more, and then pretty soon, I like couldn't get the idea out of my head. I was like losing sleep at night, trying to think about ways I could do it. Uh, and then, so in 2015, I decided to try it. And I was so nervous about the whole thing that I didn't tell anybody. Um, you know, leading up to it, I just. Um, you know, the great thing about soloing, I guess, is that you know, you don't, you're not making plans with a partner. <laughs> so you can have all these plans in your head, and then you can just fail on them, and no one will know. It's like nothing ever happened. <laughs> so I didn't tell anybody. And then about 3 p.m., I was like, um, when I was about to climb, I was about to do it, I was kind of thinking, like, I should probably tell somebody, because I don't want to be like one of those climbers that didn't tell anybody where they were going and then had to cut their arm off or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I saw Alexa Flower, who's a badass climber on SAR. She was in the that day. And I was like, okay, Alexa, I have to tell you something. And she got so excited. She was like, I need to tell somebody. Can I just tell one person? And I was like, okay, one person. She's like, okay, I'm going to tell Eric's one. And I was like, oh, there's a whole circle, right? <laughs> so I think Eric must have told some people because um, by the time I got to the top, some of my awesome friends were up there. Um, <laughs> Taylor Sinsich and Keisha Jankowski were on top. And in my delirious state, so at that point, this time it took me like 27 hours, and I was like, head going for a while at that point when I got to like the last pitch. And I see Taisha and Taylor up there, and I'm thinking, I didn't know they were climbing the nose. I was like, did they pass? They didn't pass me. Like, with, and I was like, I just saw Tisha yesterday. Or was it two days ago? I was so confused, like, why they were up there. It turns out they were up there just to meet me on top, which was awesome, because right? I, I had no idea. I like, didn't tell them I was going up there, you know? And they had beer and rotisserie chicken, which was famous. <laughs> <laughs> and Taylor managed to snap these awesome photos. Like, of, I mean, look at these badass shots. <laughs> At the time, it was like hour 25 or 26, and Taylor was like, put your arms up, and like, smile, like, look over there, and I was like, I'm trying to move the tunnel. He's like, it's an hour 24 hours, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad, because like, look at these photos, they're not great. So anyways, um, 
um, after that, it was like super satisfied. I was like, oh yeah, I got that feeling of like climbing for 27 hours straight. I was like, I slept for like a day afterwards. I um, was super satisfied and tired. Um, but eventually, I started to forget how painful it was. Um, <laughs> started to get feeling back in like my hips. My hands went back down to like a normal size. I was swollen. And I started thinking, okay, maybe I should do it again. Um, I started thinking of ways I could get the time down. And so then in 2015, I tried it again, but there was nobody on top, which is just cool, because it only took like 21 hours and 50 minutes. Um, so I yeah, which is also the first, happened to be the first woman to do it in less than 24 hours. So that was cool. later and I wouldn't have known. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I soloed the nose. I did it all by myself, uh, which I'm extremely proud of, but I wouldn't have been able to do it without the tremendous support from my entire Yosemite community. So it's like I soloed it, but I didn't solo it. <laughs> Miranda 
almost five years now. I've been working in the park for 11 years. When I first came out to Yosemite from Maryland, I was pretty much just a gym climber. I had climbed a handful of times outside, and that was mostly bouldering and sport climbing. So I kind of came to Yosemite with very little experience. I was a Gumby. So working up in Tuolumne Meadows was kind of the perfect place for me. There's lots of bouldering and sport climbing there, and I just got after it, like bagging really easy peaks, uh, just scrambling up stuff in the high Sierra. And then eventually I started working the shoulder season down here in the valley. And that's when I bought my first trad rack and started placing gear, my first trad whipper, I had my first epics, <laughs> got benighted for the first few times, and all that good stuff. And eventually I just kept at it and slowly worked my way up to the big stone. Climbed El Cap like 15 times now, I think. Mostly on the same handful of routes. I've done the nose probably um, at least 10 times. <laughs> the first time I did the nose, we did it in like three and a half days. It was full on adventure. And there was tons of people up there and there was rescues happening around us. Kind of whittled my time down to just like 10 hours. In 2015, I rope solo the nose for the first time, and I was trying to do it in a day. It took me 27 hours. In 2016, I came back and tried it again. It took me just under 22 hours that time. And that was actually the first time a woman had rope soloed the nose in less than 24 hours. And that was cool because, you know, I know a lot of women can do it, and sometimes we just need a little bit of a push. Okay, someone's done it, now it's my turn. I think what happens a lot in the climbing community is there's doubt. You know, as a female climber, people will doubt you. And it's not just for men, it's for women too. So I think women, you know, A, need to respect each other and have confidence in their female yeah. partners, but also women need to be confident in themselves and know that you know, they can do it. Another reason why I could never you know, stop climbing is the community that I find. You know, I can travel all over the world and meet all new people that are still kind of in the same community. They kind of take me in and show me around their local climbing areas. And for me, that's huge. Like being able to travel somewhere else and connect with the locals about, you know, through this like, strange like fringe sport media. Always kind of finding that challenge, you know? Finding that challenge and exploring new terrain that you haven't been to before. Those are the kind of the big things about climbing that keeps me going forward. Joe Whitford, uh, Scott Stowe, of course, Peter Croft, who will be speaking here later tonight. Ken Yeager was for the YM, YMS, Josh Helling. A lot of these epic climbers who go on to climb uh, very well and, and all over the world. What is it about YMS, the Yosemite Mountaineering School, that's like birthing these great climbers? Any thoughts there? Um, I think Yosemite just draws a lot of people who want to push themselves in different ways. And, you know, guiding here is just a way we can be here. And I, don't know. I think it's all your time at Swan Slab, actually. It's so many ascents at Swan Slab. You climb, and like, you, know, you climb Commitment Today, you've done it 4,000 times. All of those equal climbing the nose in under 24 hours. Yeah. And so, how about like a best guide tip? Like, because my guide friends, you know, Mikey Schaefer was a YMS uh, guide. He taught me, you know, use a prussic for rappelling. So now, I'm always using a prussic. Any advice? What's your, what's your guide tip? Uh, like, be chill. <laughs> patience. Don't stress out too much. Because no. patience is really good with yeah. your clients. Yeah. People sit there. Okay, better. More tips. See, that's so smart. And then what about like the Chamonix guides? 
like where they like calling their clients up and like smoking cigarettes and maybe burning them with their cigarettes to get them to go faster. <laughs> Not a great model. It just seems like it's really hard on your body. A guy like that. <laughs> yeah, longevity, right? So longevity. Is Any questions out there for Brenda? Any Q and A here? Anybody got hand in the air? <laughs> Miranda Oakley. Miranda Oakley, right here. Okay. This Justin, hold your applause. This Justin, late question. Got it in for the bell. <laughs> As a gummy, when you're climbing yourself, how do you sleep and and haul your gear up? Or is it just one long push? Oh, like, I would always do it without sleeping. I mean, not always, but... She, she's yeah, very chill. She has a very low heart rate. So yeah. she doesn't have to sleep. Very mellow and never well, sleeps. Sometimes you can sleep while you're playing your partner, as long as you have a green green. <laughs> so make sure you get a green green advice number one, and then take a long nap, okay? <laughs> okay, last one right here. Go for it. When you rope sold the nose, how much did you like free versus aid climb, like even on like more modern stuff? And the question was, if you couldn't hear it, when, when the rope sold the nose happened, what was the percentage of free climbing and aid climbing-ish? Uh, a lot of free climbing because, I mean, the nose is mostly free climbing. I mean, there's a lot of like five, eight, five, nine, five, ten. So it's like free climbing. Towards the top, it was a lot less, you know, yeah. obviously, because I was tired. Yeah, I don't know the percentage. And then when you were passing people up there, which did you pass anybody? Was there people on the nose? I mean, there always is, kind of, two right? parties, yeah. And were they like, hey, what's up? Whoa, you're by yourself. So yeah. cool. Well, it is. And then you're like, can I get a belay? No, don't do it. Don't do it. My smart. My smart. Don't do that. Yeah. This is a reference to a controversy in the past. So you took a belay, right? This just in. That's not true. But when you pass these people, what was their reaction? Because it's so cool, right? Like, yeah, so they were really nice about it because you know when you're soloing generally you're going a lot slower because you have to wrap back down and clean the pitch but yeah the people I passed when I did it um, you know the last time they were just like oh go ahead so that was cool yeah they like got out of my way they were like, oh. And what's cool is that like, you get to pass them when you lead it, then you repel them, pass them again, then you jump back up and pass them again. Like, hey man, so you have this like kind of cool conversation. Like, actually, I was thinking, and it didn't to that earlier answer. Did that happen or no? Yeah. What if they said you couldn't pass? What would your reaction be? You I'm passing. I'm passing. I'm passing. Like, is that another one camera? That's so good. Thank you so much. Is that your forehead? Okay, cool. Oh, uh, I'll let go of my foot. Just you step on the forehead. It wouldn't count, right? Oh, that's right. You yeah. can't because a person. Yeah. That would be cheating. Yeah. Wow, what ethics. Give it up for Miranda. Okay, right now.